my invisible friends, hello and welcome back to our series on electrical engineering. Tonight we talk about the rotating magnetic field in three-phase machines. So far, we have accepted the assertion that with three coils, stationary and separated 120 degrees from one another, and carrying a set of three-phase currents, the rotating magnetic field will appear in the air gap between the stator and the rotor. It is time that we look at this assertion more closely. We begin with a visit to our high school mathematics, trigonometry, and then we continue with a review of one of the first assignments in our course, a magnetic circuit. And then it all begins. Remember your trigonometry. In high school, we remember two trigonometric identities. One to compute what was the sine of a sum of two angles. Sine of x plus y is sine of x cosine y plus sine of y cosine of x. And also its companion, the sine of the difference of those two same angles. If we add them together, look what happens. The terms on the right, they cancel out and we get this expression, but what we care for is the product, sine x cosine y. Let's solve for that. Sine x cosine y is one half of the sum of the sine of the sum plus the sine of the difference of the angles x and y. And that is the formula that we will need at the end of this session. Please keep that in mind. Another thing that we remember from our math courses is a sliding function, a function that slides along the x-axis, the independent variable. There is a function f of x, and uh, f of x minus a t, in reality, is the same function, but it's sliding towards the right with a velocity a. And what if it's uh, f of x plus a t? Then it's the same function, but sliding towards the left with a velocity a. Now, it's time we go to the simple magnetic circuit we saw at the beginning of our course, this one. A hollow iron cylinder, ideal iron, eh? And inside there is a solid iron cylinder, both of them are ideal iron, infinite magnetic permeability, which signifies zero magnetic field. H is zero, not the flux. H is zero, there's no magnetic potential drop in that iron. And there is a small air gap, delta naught, in length, separating them both. To identify the points along that air gap, we make reference to that system of reference, alpha zero at the top, 90 degrees here on the right, 180 degrees at the bottom. We carve two slots on the inner side of the outer hollow cylinder, and in those two slots, we set a coil with n turns and the current i. If that current in that coil will create a magnetic field in the air gap that looks like this. Yes, it has the same value between 0 degrees and 180 and uh, the opposite and constant value between 180 and 360 degrees. And what was the value of that? Well, the total magnetic potential drop like that was Ni divided by 2 delta naught. That was the value of the magnetic field. Multiplied by G alpha. G alpha who? What is G alpha? G alpha is the unit square wave. It has that shape, but it has height uh, 1. If we multiply that by mu naught, we get the flux density in the air gap that has exactly the same shape, a square wave. If that current is a function of time, let's say that current is root to i, cosine omega t, that is the expression. What is happening with the magnetic flux density in the air gap? This is what's happening. It still has that squarish look along the air gap, but now its amplitude is changing sinusoidally with time. We have a magnetic field that is not going anywhere, but it's pulsating, it pumps like that. We have a pulsating magnetic field, and that is the conclusion. When we have a single coil with an AC sinusoidal current, we create a pulsating magnetic field, not a rotating magnetic field. 
and there is a strong difference, very important one. Analytically, we can represent the unit square wave G of alpha like this, using Fourier series decomposition. An infinite sum of sinusoids with an ever smaller and smaller amplitudes as you see that. Let me write explicitly the first few terms of that series, like so. We have that the first term is the widest one, 4 over pi sine of alpha, and then sine of 3 alpha divided by 3, sine of 5 alpha divided by 5, etc. If we plot them together in this um, diagram here, we see the fundamental component up here, the one that is uh, 4 over pi, and then here is the third harmonic, one-third of the height of the fundamental one, the fifth harmonics, the seventh harmonics, and so on. What we see here is the sum of those four curves so far. It starts to look squarish. It's not completely square, because to achieve that perfect square um, um, graphic, we would need an infinite number of sinusoids. Let me show you how it looks if we add two more components, the ninth and the eleventh harmonics. It looks like that. I made my point. But now, if we multiply that by the function of time and the amplitude, mu naught, number of terms, root 2i, that is the peak value of the current divided by 2, the length of the air gap, multiplied by the function cosine of omega t, we know what's going to happen. What's going to happen is that all of them will pulsate at the frequency omega radians per sec. They will increase and decrease and change sign, cosinusoidally with time, but their shape remains in space what it is. All of them. Let's concentrate on the fundamental one, because it's the biggest one, right? That's the fundamental one, the fundamental space component of the flux density in the air gap created by one coil at alpha equals zero. We write this term here just as B max, like so, right? B max, B max sine alpha cosine omega t. It's easier that way. That is the flux density in the air gap created by that coil with that sinusoidal current as a function of alpha, the position in the air gap, and of time. Sine alpha cosine omega t. Does it remind you of something? Of course it does. It reminds you of that identity that we saw at the beginning. Sine of x cos sine of y. So we can decompose that expression into the sum of two sinusoids like this one. Both of them, they have half the amplitude, b max over 2. And one is sine of alpha plus omega t, and the other is sine alpha minus omega t. You realize? that those two sinusoids, one of them is moving to the right and one is moving to the left, or shall we say, one of them is rotating clockwise and the other counterclockwise, but both with a velocity omega radians per second. And that is a tremendous finding. One current, sinusoidal, in one coil, creates a pulsating magnetic field. That is a reality. But we can see that pulsating magnetic field has two rotating magnetic fields that have the same velocity but opposite directions, omega radians per sec, and that is with one coil. Let me repeat, one pulsating field becomes two rotating fields, one that moves clockwise, the other counterclockwise, but both at the same speed, omega radians per sec. What happens when we add two more coils? The first coil A sits at alpha zero degrees and carries a current with zero degrees of phase. The second coil will sit at negative 120 degrees on the stator, that is coil B, and has a current that is also lagging 120 degrees on the third coil. Coil C is sitting at alpha negative 240 degrees with a current that is lagging 240 degrees. Let's add up the magnetic fields created by the three coils with the three currents. For the first one, for the coil A, we have what we've seen before, a magnetic field that rotates counterclockwise and another that rotates clockwise with a velocity omega radians per second. For the second coil, coil B, 
we have is that um, is a coil is sitting I think at a 120 degrees you see that here and the current is lagging 120 degrees so it's also decomposed into two magnetic fields one that rotates counterclockwise and another uh, but negative 240 degrees is actually the same as um, plus 120 degrees right that's correct and the third coil the third coil is sitting at negative 240 degrees which is the same as plus 120 degrees and the current lags by 240 degrees which is the same plus 120 degrees again we have a magnetic field that rotates counterclockwise with a phase shift of 240 degrees and uh, a rotating magnetic field that rotates clockwise. Positive 240 degrees is the same as negative 120 degrees. If we add the those three contributions together like so, then the fields that are rotating counterclockwise, they cancel out. Why? Because they are out of phase in space by 120 degrees, they cancel out. But the three fields that rotate clockwise from the three coils, they add up. And we have a net rotating magnetic field that is moving clockwise with a velocity omega, which is what we wanted to demonstrate. But, 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 wait a minute. You say, you are concentrating only on the fundamental component of the square wave, which is the reality. What happens with the third harmonics and the fifth and all the others? Well, the same way we worked with the fundamental, we could have worked with the third harmonics and realized that it also creates a rotating magnetic field and that is one third in strength. No surprise there. And it's rotating, this is interesting, at one third the speed of the fundamental. But you know what is far out? That it's rotating backwards. Well, the fundamental is rotating at omega radians per second clockwise the third harmonics has one third of amplitude and it's rotating backwards and one third of the speed. Well, you realize that if you have a rotor that is following the fundamental clockwise and every so often the negatively rotating one third um, magnetic field passes by, it will, it will shake the rotor, it will create vibration and maintenance issues. That is not good. How can we eliminate that pesky third harmonics? And the solution is distributed windings and variable pitch, which is a topic for a future episode in this series. Some homework. I invite you to investigate what happens with the fifth harmonics and with the seventh harmonics. What happens with those two? And with that, my friends, I say good night, thank you very much for keeping company with me, and I hope to again with you in our next video.